Yeah. All of us, we were frontline combat camera women. We'd come back with the goods. These camera women blazed a trail that they didn't even know they were blazing at the time. They were incredibly brave, incredibly resourceful. Women on the front lines, not as soldiers, but as journalists for years. Five women worked as pioneering photojournalists for a fledgling CNN, taking their cameras to some of the most violent and deadly places on earth. They covered wars, famines, and revolutions, and regularly risked their lives to bring these events into our homes. Now their lives and careers are the subject of the new documentary, No Ordinary Life. We'll talk to one of those women in a moment. For first, we're joined by the director of No Ordinary Life, Heather O'Neill. Heather, thanks for joining us. Thanks for having us, Frank. You bet. As a former CNNer, I was grateful for the way you captured the sense of mission of the news organization that I remember and these amazing photojournalists and inspiring women who helped to make it great. Um, why did you feel that it was important to tell these stories? I mean, you know, I think we often don't think about who is behind the camera. And as a director and having worked with, with a few of these women, I really wanted people to feel and understand what it was like to be behind the camera from their point of view. You know, those, those experiences, those split second moments about what was to unfold. Um, I thought was a really important story to, to bring forward. And it's a largely untold story. Um, these women, as you mentioned, were pioneers in their field and um, it's just remarkable. And they also have a sisterhood that's lasted over three decades. Yeah, and, and you really beautifully uh, uh, let them tell their own story about that sisterhood and it, and it is really wonderful to, to see. Um, these women were as competent as any man, were as daring as any man. But the one thing that they all seemed to uh, face in common was at one time or another, someone said to them, no, this is not for you. This is not your field. You, you're not allowed to do this. Yeah, uh, Margaret Moth, um, who was an incredible photojournalist, um, really started out in New Zealand. She, she could not get a job as a, as a camera person. And she tried for years and people would say, you know, oh, we don't, you know, we don't give jobs to women. Um, Jane Evans, another uh, camera woman in the film, had a hard time getting her foot in the door too. And, you know, I think collectively what I learned from making this film is, is all of them just never took no for an answer. They, they never accepted the fact that their gender would be a barrier for them to, to get into this field. And they were all incredibly successful. And, and you talked about this a moment ago, but the point of view that these women bring to their work, it is... I think all of them will say sometimes slightly different than than what the men bring to the job. Uh, and, and I think of it in terms of, of war coverage. We often focus on the, quote, military porn of, of war, the hardware, the bombs, the jets, and all, all of that sort of thing. And these women so frequently, and one of them talked about it, you could, they would focus on a sound. Uh, a sound of, of uh, just the quiet sounds and, and most importantly, the people. Yeah, uh, you know, I think all of these women were incredible, incredibly talented photographers, but their approach was unique. I think they really kind of dialed into more of the humanitarian stories of some of these conflicts that they were covering. You know, what was happening to, to women, what was happening to children as well. I think they were really, you know, a lot more sensitive to to what was happening to civilians and you know they wanted to sort of reach into you know talk to these women about what they were experiencing in their lives and you know the trauma that they were going through and i think sometimes you see in their images you know just a very completely different side of a war um compared to you know perhaps what a male photographer would would focus on and it was it was sometimes those quiet moments or, or finding a different way to tell that story. But I always think that the human connection was the thing that was most important in their storytelling. Mm. To that end, I, I want to share a clip from your film. Uh, and this is uh, Mary Rogers, who's in Mosul, Iraq in 2017. Let's take a look. The citizens of Mosul you know, were under ISIS control for three years. It must have been hell living under it. 
The people that would come out that had hidden in their house, you know, for days with no food or water, you know, the looks on their faces, I really felt for them. The things people had to re resort to to survive were incredible. It's important to let these people talk, tell their stories. Okay. Alhamdulillah, as-salam, ya hajji. Shlonich. I salam alaykum. I'm going to say alaykum. I'm going to say alaykum. No, 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 that's important to me. Mary Rogers there. We also saw the terrific CNN correspondent, uh, Ben Wiedemann, in that scene. Um, the, the focus, as you said, it, it, it's more of a human focus. Yeah, absolutely. Um, you know, talking to Mary about that story, I think what really got to her in her interview was, was the children. You know, this is a, you know, um, Mosul had been under ISIS control for three years. And you know, they wanted to, to talk to these people to find out, you know, what that absolute living hell, you know, once they were out of there and, and rescued, literally. But also what happened to the children, I think, you know, as Mary talks about in the film, you know, she's not so caught up in the action of war as is, you know, what's happening to the civilians who, by no choice of their own, you know, are forced to live in these conditions and under these circumstances. And I think it's a really interesting perspective. And and it's unique um, completely with all of these five women. Well, and, and in Mary's case, she had she spent her career going from war zone to disaster zone, one country to the other. And as I was watching that, I thought, I wonder if there was a personal cost. And you address that at the end of the film. And it seems to me that to a certain extent, all of these women paid some level of a personal cost. Yeah, definitely. Um, uh, Mary is still out there in the field to this day. Um, she's incredible. Um, absolutely. You know, when they first started out in the 80s, they, they all talked about the fact that, you know, nobody recognized PTSD at that point in time. You know, there was no hotline you could call back in, the, in those days to talk about, you know, what you were witnessing, the trauma that you were witnessing in the field. And I think that that's uh, in all of their cases, they there's been a mark that's left. Um, they all shared, you know, deeply personal stories about the toll that it took on them. But again, I think that's where this this sisterhood really helped them in so many ways because they only had each other to talk to, you know, and process what they had seen. But you know, interesting journalists are hard to crack in the sense that they don't always want to talk about what they're witnessing because, as Maria says in the film you know, the trauma that they were witnessing that other people were experiencing was so much greater than their own. But, you know, I think to this day, they, they all carry the, the scars of, of, of what, they, what they captured. I also feel like they all carry to some extent some guilt, guilt over surviving it, guilt over leaving people behind. One of them talked about how uh, when you cover a war, just like a soldier, you leave the war zone, you get on a plane, and then you wake up essentially at Starbucks in America. And did you get the sense that they are working through that or still living with that? I think it's still a part of them. Um, you know, stories that they shared with me and stories they shared, you know, if we were just off the record, I, you know, are with them every day. Um, you know, I think Cindy Strand, you know, sometimes when she sees little kids, she, you know, she covered so many you know, orphans and people that were migrating and displaced that, you know, she's got a soft spot when she sees little kids. And yeah, I mean, it, it's, it, they carry this guilt with them. Um, because as Jane Evans said in the film, you know, you get home and it's a plane ride away and you're back in the land of normal. And sometimes it's hard to act normal. And I think that, you know, Maria can talk a little bit about that guilt too. Um, she was very eloquent about that in the film. But yeah, they, they carry it with them. I think, I think it is hard for them still to this day to process some of what they saw. Well, Heather, uh, it's a terrific film. Thank you very much. And I know it's in the festival circuit now. And at some point, I hope uh, viewers will be able to find it uh, on demand or in a theater. Thank you very much. Thank you, Frank. All right, we are going to take a short uh, break right now. When we come back, uh, we're going to talk to Maria Fleet. Uh, one of the camera women featured in the new documentary, No Ordinary Life. So many 
many times people have asked me, why do you do it? Why do you risk your life? I think it's important to let the rest of the world know what's going on. And welcome back. We're talking about the new documentary, No Ordinary Life. It's a look at the sometimes dangerous work that CNN camera women and other camera women experience to bring us the news from around the world, including from war zones, as you're about to see. We went through this armed checkpoint. Soon we attracted some attention and a couple of pickup trucks with guys with guns came and we figured we needed to get out of there. The guys with the AK-47s pulled up right next to us and my driver was talking to them across me. Then they slowed back up and just started firing into our car. Okay, that's gunfire. Okay, we've just come under attack. Under attack. And joining us now is the camera woman who was in that car as gunfire reigned in, Maria Fleet. Uh, Maria, thanks for joining us. Thank you. I want to ask you about that uh, scene first. Um, the, the correspondent who was with you was so calm and just do, uh, describing what was happening as if it was play by play, you were being fired upon. Um, it, it spoke to me to the unpredictability of war zones and how suddenly you could find yourself under fire after speaking to someone car to car. What happened in that moment? Well, uh, and I should be clear of th this incident. At, in, in this particular incident, I had transitioned into a producer role, and I was shooting with a smaller camera from uh, a, a different car. Mm -hmm. And so that those images that you see right there are uh, of a, a colleague of mine. But we were we were in two different cars in a convoy and what happened was we were uh this was just after baghdad had fallen to the u.s uh marines and they had not moved on to crete yet which was considered to be which was uh, saddam's hometown and so it was considered that he would probably make his last stand there if he were to make a last stand and so we had spent some time going all the way around to Crete and kind of looking, uh, you know, looking to see what what might be going on there. And there was, uh, and we were live, we were broadcasting live at the time, we had uh, the ability to track a satellite and, and be live. And this was all happening and unfolding live on, on CNN's air. Mm. But we went, We uh, there were some people that came out of Tikrit and told us that there was, uh, there were no, there was no army, there was no uh, Saddam paramilitaries in the town. There were only the town elders that were talking about having a meeting, talking about giving up the town without a fight. And so that piqued our interest immediately. We were like, wow, mm -hmm. that's interesting. We could, if we could get that, if we could talk to those elders. So we went, we followed these, these uh, people that we talked to into the town. Um, and as we got closer to the town, we encountered this checkpoint. And uh, it, it was not, we didn't know there was going to be a checkpoint there. And you can't really, you know, turn around at an armed checkpoint that kind of invites people to shoot at you. So, <laughs> so we continued on in, they waved us in and told us not to film. And uh, we, were we just stopped at a little group of shops shop fronts and our translator jumped out but as he jumped out uh some other cars drove up with um some gunmen in them mm -hmm. and we realized this is probably not a good situation our cars could get hemmed in here so we uh we turned around both of our cars turned around and we um we left, but they, those cars with the gunmen pursued us. And at one point they pulled up right next to my car and my driver was talking across mm -hmm. me to these gunmen, uh, presumably just saying, we're just international journalists and, you know, we mean no harm. Uh, so, uh, and, and that then they, yeah, they, that didn't seem they, to matter. They come back and proceeded to shoot our car with, 
you know, 12 rounds actually came into my vehicle, your, my driver. Your flak jacket saved your life, didn't it? Uh, I, I think it, it, yeah, it very well may have. I had on a flak jacket, a bullet hit the, the very corner of the, uh, the, the bulletproof shield that is in the, inside the flak jacket. And uh, the shrapnel kind of grazed my head, but I had, you know, I had a, like a, you know, just a scratch, basically, literally just a scratch on my head that was bleeding. Your head bleeds a lot, as it turns out. <laughs> my driver actually got, uh, he had a bullet that came right across the top of mm. his head and, uh, and it just sliced his scalp basically. Yeah. And he continued driving. Maria, um, you know, when people hear you describe this story in such a really nonchalant sort of way, they, they wonder, is this woman crazy? Why would she do this? What, why would she put herself in that position? Um, answer those folks. Well, this, uh, I, all of us uh, feel very strongly that these are, um, these stories are stories that are happening in our world and, you know, in your world. And you should know about what's happening in your world. In this particular case, um, for Americans, you know, there was a, an intervention in Iraq. The U.S. military had gone into Iraq, and these things were being done in the name of American people. So uh, for an American network, you know, with an American audience, they, they needed to know what was being done in their name. And we all, we all live in the world, as, as Mary says eloquently in the film, we all live in this world together and we we all need to know what's what's happening in our world yeah um th i sometimes wonder you know when you're in the field and you are risking your life to get these pictures for us to educate the world and you call in to new york or to atlanta and say we have this amazing footage and then this incredible story and a show passes on your story or says you know, we'll give you 30 seconds of, of pictures or a Vosat, you know, pictures with, with a little bit of sound, but we don't really have time. Can you talk to the frustration and upset that, that, that you and others might feel when you'd hear something like that? Honestly, uh, working for CNN, that very rarely happened, I'm very happy to say, because we had 24 hours a day to fill <laughs> And, you know, and so that that rarely happened. There was there was a frustration at times that uh, you kind of allude to where sometimes colleagues would colleagues at CNN would use agency footage, uh, footage that we would get from from a news agency mm -hmm. that was covering the same story we were. And they would use the same footage just because it was more available or it was right at their fingertips. And that was that was frustrating to us because. Yeah, we risked our lives to get those yeah. pictures. So it was our pictures. <laughs> right. And, and, and in some ways, I feel like the news organizations, CNN included, have changed their focus and, and are less interested in international coverage and, and less interested in war and the stories of, of refugees and their suffering and all of that. I'm going to take a short break right now. When we come back, I do want to ask you about that the current state of war coverage and international coverage. We'll be back in a moment with Maria Fleet. And we're back with the photojournalist Maria Fleet. Maria, I was asking you about the state of news coverage today, especially as, as it pertains to global news coverage and war coverage, it doesn't seem like there's an appetite for it. Uh, and maybe that's not right, the right way to put it, but people don't want to hear it. And, and I feel like in some ways the networks and, and even CNN, that we don't see the world anymore. What, it, it, am I right? Well, I think uh, 
I mean, I think the pendulum kind of swings as the as you know the, the news cycle changes, and there's more of a focus and less of a focus on international news. But I mean, CNN has never really given up on international news, and I don't think ever will. But we still have you know many many bureaus uh, throughout the world, and we have a, a, a dedicated network just to international yeah. news. Um, but I think, you know, one of the things that your question gets to is just the the fatigue that audiences feel about, you know, seeing refugees and seeing war coverage and feeling frustrated that they, they don't know what they can do. How how can I help? And there's a fatigue that sets in. And I think that was that's some of the one of the things that we as photographers were always trying to break through with our images as well we were always trying to think of ways to to portray look for images that would break through that would tell the story in a different way it doesn't have to be the same kind of picture of someone fleeing but maybe it's a more quiet thoughtful side, uh, you know, side moment that can allow the viewer to reflect a little bit rather than being bombarded with really terrifying images. And that's something that I know all of us as photographers tried to do. Yeah, well, I, I, I must say that, that you were successful in doing it. And and, and we are grateful for, for your service uh, to CNN and to, to news gathering and to, to, to all of us who, who benefited from what you did and, and the, the life you risked for us. So thank you very much, Maria. Thank you. Uh, the documentary, once again, is No Ordinary Life. My thanks to Maria Fleet and to Heather O'Neill. And thanks to you for watching. I hope you'll join us on the audio podcast later this week. Uh, we're going to continue the conversation with both of them. Thanks for watching.